Okay, good evening class. Tonight I will be talking about the following topics. First, I'm going to talk about distribution of data. And under this topic are the following subtopics. We have normal distribution, rectangular distribution, triangular distribution, and confidence interval. Second topic we'll be talking about is Q-test, and the third one is T-test. So under T-test, we're going to talk about one sample T-test and two sample T-test. In order to talk about these topics, I would like to make use of this PowerPoint presentation here. Okay, so last time we talked about detecting systematic error and random error. So in this uh, in our discussion today, um, I would like to talk about a review on basic statistics in which the following terminologies arise. We have the mean value and the standard deviation. The mean value is the average of all the measurements. It is essentially the central value in a given set of numbers or in a given set of measurements in the context of chemical analysis. The formula for population mean is this one, and for the sample mean is designated by this x with a bar on top of it. Standard deviation, on the other hand, is a measure that is used to quantify the amount of variation of the data set to the mean. So how much each individual measurement vary from the mean, or how much do the individual measurements deviate from the mean. So that is the essence of the standard deviation. It has the following formula, S is equal to square root of summation of each individual measurement minus mean squared all over N minus 1, wherein N is the number of measurements minus 1. So take note, for sample standard deviation, we have minus 1 at the denominator. In chemical analysis, we make use of sample standard deviation since we are taking samples from a population to represent that population. We have talked about this exercise already and have answered this exercise in Microsoft Excel. Here is what we call the Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian distribution is what we call the normal distribution. Given a definite set of measurements, we have mu, which is the mean, and the upper and lower limit at 68% confidence level is mu plus standard deviation, the, uh, the upper limit and the lower limit is mu minus standard deviation at this 68% uh, confidence interval. At 95% confidence interval, we have mu plus 2 standard deviation and mu minus 2 standard deviation as the upper limit and lower limit respectively. And finally, at 99% confidence interval or 99% confidence level, we have the upper limit of mu or mean plus a 3 standard deviation and mu or mean minus 3 standard deviation as the, low, as the lower limit. This is developed by Johann Carl Friedrich Gauss and he was a German mathematician and physical scientist who contributed significantly to many fields. The following histogram is a graphical representation used to understand how numerical data is distributed. Take note that the mean or the central value is around here, meaning almost all the data are gravitated towards the mean. And that is the essence of the Gaussian distribution or the normal distribution. So there is a very high probability of finding similar measurements near the value of the mean. And as you go outwards, you will have low probability of finding those measurements. So these are the extreme values. Here is an extreme value, and here is an extreme value. Some of the terminologies that are being used in statistics, we have skewness and kurtosis. So if the Gaussian distribution is negatively skewed, it means that uh, it has its tail at the left, around here, and if it's positively skewed, it has its tail to the other side, this side. This one has no skewness. Okay. Skewness is a measure of probability distribution symmetry. A normal Gaussian curve has no skewness. Kurtosis, on the other hand, is 
to measure of the tailedness and peakedness relative to the normal distribution. So if your Gaussian distribution has a um, higher peak, meaning, uh, for example, this one compared to this one, these two have different kurtosis. So one of these is more tailed than the other, and one of these has a higher peak than the other. We also have what we call confidence interval. So confidence interval is a type of interval estimate of a population parameter and is used to indicate reliability of an estimate. For example, if you read some research publications, the results are often expressed in terms of the confidence of the experimenter of their results. For instance, we are 95% confident that the true value of the parameter is in our confidence interval. The formula for the confidence interval is is equal to the mean mean plus minus a value of t over square root of n t is the t value from the t table and s is the standard deviation n is the number of measurements okay so as i have discussed previously 95 percent confidence interval or 95 percent confidence level is within within this range so if our mean is 3.6 3.6 plus 2 standard deviation of the measurement is the upper limit around this one um, 4 point, 4 point 0.08 and around here is the lower limit which is um, 3 point, uh, 3.1 yeah. okay. a sample exercise is provided here we have uh, the carbohydrate content of a glycoprotein a protein with sugars attached to it is determined to be these values and uh, grams of carbohydrate per 100 grams of protein in replicate analysis find the 50 percent and 90 percent confidence intervals for the carbohydrate content take note that the formula for confidence interval is mean plus minus t standard deviation square root of n if we calculate the mean for these measurements, we will get a value of, we have a mean value of 12.5, standard deviation of 0.4. The number of measurements is, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we have three, square root of 5, and the value of T at 9. 50% and 90% confidence intervals is provided in the t-table. Okay. So here is our t-table. At 90% confidence interval. And at 5 measurements, we have 2.015 as our value for um, value for t. 2.015. All you need to calculate is the value of this expression we have 12.5 plus minus 0 0.4 grams the other type of distribution that can be used is what we call the rectangular distribution this distribution is a function that represents a continuous distribution and constant probability meaning all outcomes are equally likely to occur this distribution is a reasonable default model in the absence of any other information. So for example, if you are to undertake a baseline study in the determination of a particular analyte in, uh, in a given place, then it might be good to make use of rectangular distribution since you don't know any other information about it since you are performing a baseline study. In order to reduce the uncertainty contributors to the standard deviation equivalence, the, standard, the value of the standard deviation shall be divided by the square root of 3. For example, um, we have a given measurement here. When performing a measurement uncertainty analysis in the result, yield to plus minus 1 ppm, and we don't know the factors affecting the uncertainties 
Hence, we would like to propose a uniform distribution or rectangular distribution. The standard deviation of the measurement is plus minus 1 ppm. This one is standard deviation. And therefore, the uncertainty of the measurement is standard deviation divided by square root of 3. So standard deviation is 1 divided by square root of 3 is equal to 0 0.577. That is the resulting uncertainty of our measurement. A triangular distribution, on the other hand, is another reason, reasonable default model in the absence of any other information. So it's similar to rectangular distribution. It may be used in baseline studies wherein you are the first to study a particular uh, substance or a particular analyte. But if it is known that the values of the quantity in question near the center of the limits are more likely than the values close to the limits and there, there may be no extreme values or there's a likelihood that there are no extreme values to come out, then triangular distribution must be used. So as you can see, like the Gaussian distribution, most of the values gravitate towards the mean value. So there's a small likelihood that extreme values or the values of the extreme high and extreme low may have a high probability of occurring in the measurement, in the study. So in that case, um, triangular distribution is a better model. So how is uncertainty determined in triangular distribution? The uncertainty is determined by standard deviation over square root of 6. So given a particular measurement making use of a triangular distribution, we take the standard, devi standard deviation of all the values divided by square root of 6 to get the uncertainty of all the measurements. Suppose you are given a type of problem like this, the slide study in the determination of of mercury in Marilog River. The word baseline study itself signifies that you should not use a normal distribution since it is the first study to be conducted to it. Okay, suppose you are given this type of problem a baseline study the determination of mercury in Marilog River. So related studies on adjacent river shows that extreme values are less likely to occur. A standard deviation of mercury measurement or mercury concentration in the measurement is plus minus 1.5 ppm. Therefore, what is the uncertainty of the measurement? So given that it is a baseline study, there can only be two choices what type of distribution can be used. So we are to determine the uncertainty. Since take note that extreme values are less likely to occur, meaning most values shall gravitate towards the mean. And in that case, we have to make use of the triangular distribution. In triangular distribution, the formula is, the formula for the uncertainty value is standard deviation over square root of six. So we have 1.5 divided by square root of 6 is equal to 0 0.621. Therefore, the uncertainty of the measurement is um, plus minus 0 0.61 ppm. Okay, previously, we have talked about Gaussian distribution, triangular distribution, and rectangular distribution. Now, I would like to relate this to the detection of random errors. So how are random errors detected? Random errors are detected through the use of Q-test. Q-test is used to determine the presence of outliers. So suppose in a set of replicate measurements of a physical or chemical quantity, one or more of the obtained values may differ considerably from the majority or the rest. So this de deviant value is what they call the outlier. Q-test is utilized to decide whether or not to include these values 
in any subsequent calculation. So, the rejection of suspect observations must be based exclusively on an objective criterion and not on subjective or intuitive grounds. This is the purpose of the Q-test, to objectively decide whether or not to reject the outlier or the extreme values in a given set of measurements. Suppose in a Gaussian distribution, the mean value is 3.0 and we have this value for uh, this, this range for the 95% confidence interval. Uh, suppose this one is uh, 3.0 plus standard deviation and this one is 3.0 minus 2 standard deviation. Okay, this one is at 95% confidence interval. So if there are extreme values around here, suppose this one is um, 3.6 and this one is 4.0, this one is around 2.0 and here is 1.8. The question is, should we reject these values, 3.6 and 4.0, 2.0 and 1.8, and which values should be rejected? So that is the purpose of t-test, to decide whether or not to reject these values. Okay, what is the formula for q-test? The formula for q-test is q is equal to absolute value of the outlier minus the nearest value over the largest value minus the smallest value. Suppose we have a given set of measurements. We have 3 .0, 3 3.0, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 4.0, and, and we also have 2.9, 2.8, 2 2.2, 2 2.0, 1.8. So which of the following are the outliers and which of the following are not the outliers? Okay, so first and foremost, we would like to decide which of the following falls within the range of the 95% confidence interval. So if you calculate the value of the confidence interval, you can uh, determine the up, upper limit and the lower limit. So those that are within the upper limit and the lower limit are not considered outliers. So those that are beyond the upper limit and the lower limit are considered the outliers. But these outliers should be tested first with Q-test in order to decide whether or not they should be rejected. Suppose we have identified 2.0 and 1.8 as outlier and 3.6 and 4.0 as another outlier. So we would, like to that we would like to determine whether or not these values should be rejected. So first, uh, we would like to test 1.8. So the value of Q is 1.8 minus the nearest value to 1.8 is 2.0 minus the largest value subtracted with the smallest value. So we have the value of Q that is equal to 0 0.0909. Okay, this one is the experimental Q value that we get and we would like to we would like to compare it to the value at the Q table provided in the Q table so in the Q table is we have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 so we have n is equal to 13 and confidence interval is 95% so the value of Q in the Q table is 0.3615. Okay, the value is 0 0.3615. If the experimental value is greater than the critical value, then we should reject the outlier, reject the value in question. So the value is indeed an outlier. If it is less than 
the critical value, then we should retain the value in question. Okay, we can also do that for the other measurements provided here. Okay, suppose you have another very small value. Suppose this one is 0 0.8. Is the value 0 0.8 an outlier or not? So we can calculate it like this. We have, okay, we have 0 0.8 minus 2.0 all over 4.0 minus 0 0.8. You have a value of 0 0.375. In this case, the experimental value is greater than the critical value, which is 0 0.3615. Therefore, zero, a value of 0 0.8 is an outlier. When are outliers produced when making measurements? Outliers are often produced when there is what they call a random error. So they are just produced by uncontrollable changes in the experiment. We can detect random error through determination of outliers in measurement. Okay, finally, in order to detect systematic errors in measurement, we have to make use of the t-test. Okay, the student's t-test was introduced in 1908 by William Silly Gossett, who was a chemist working for Guinness Brewery in Dublin, Ireland. So, student was his pen name. He devised the t-test as a way to cheaply monitor the quality of stout. So, the quality of their beer produce or their beer products. So, he published the t-test in Biometrica in 1908. So, how does the t-test determine whether or not there is a systematic error? So, there are two ways to make use of the t-test. One is to make use of what we call the confidence interval. In the first case, we would like to answer the following question. The question is, does our measured answer agree with the accepted, accepted answer or is it within experimental error? Take note that in a normal distribution curve, we have the mean value and the upper limit and the lower limit of the 95% confidence interval. The upper limit is the mean value plus two standard deviation, wherein, whereas the lower limit is the mean value minus two standard deviation. So all the values within this region is acceptable since this one is called the acceptance region. Outside this region is the rejection region. So this one is the rejection region for above the upper limit and this one is the rejection region beyond the lower limit. So we have, this one is 95% of all the measurements, and this one is just 2.5%, and this one is 2.5%. Okay, so one of the ways to, de to determine whether or not there is a systematic error is to compare your value to that of the standard. Suppose you have a standard value having a, having a measurement of mu, this one around the mean value so if our measurement falls within this region of the standard deviation or within this within the acceptance region then our measurement is acceptable and most likely there is no systematic error in our measurement we also have what they call a t-test table when making use of the t-test in the first case we have to compare our measured result with a known value the known value is uh, the known value is what they call a standard a standard reference material which i have discussed previously okay, suppose you have this exercise you purchased a standard reference material coal sample certified by the ni nist national institute of standards and technology to contain 3.10 percent by weight sulfur a percent by mass sulfur are testing a new analytical method to see whether it can produce the known value. The measured values are 3.29, 3.22, 3.30, and 3.23 percent by weight sulfur. Does your answer agree with the known answer? Okay, so what is done here is this standard reference material is subjected to chemical analysis. And this chem chemical analysis made use of a new analyt analytical method. We would like to determine whether or not there is a systematic error in this new analytical method and that is why we would like to make use of a one sample t-test. So in a one sample t-test, 
we would like to determine the confidence interval. So if or if our value is outside the confidence interval, then there is systematic error in this new analytical method. So first we would like to determine the confidence interval. Confidence interval has a formula of mean plus t s squared of n. The mean value for all these measurements is okay, the mean value is 3.26 and the t value provided by the t table is uh, at 95% confidence interval we have four measurements so 2.776 okay, we have four measurements and the t value is 2.776 standard deviation is 0 0.0 Zero four one divided by square root of n, wherein n is the number of measurements. So we have three point twenty six plus minus the. Okay, so this one is zero point zero six ppm. Therefore, the upper and lower limits are. Suppose we have a Gaussian distribution curve, three point twenty six. We have 3.26 plus 0 .08, 0 0.06 is 3.32 and 3.20. So suppose this one is our Gaussian distribution. The value of the standard reference material is, is 3.10 and, it, and it's outside this acceptable region. So therefore, there is systematic error in the measurement since the values that are produced by the new analytical method is uh, is statistically different from the standard value of the standard reference material so therefore there is systematic error in this measurement another way to make use of t-test in determining systematic error in chemical analysis is through the use of two sample t-test the previous one is a one sample t-test in which we have the standard reference material and we compare our measurement to that of the standard reference material. Another way is to make use of a two sample t-test. So the, the two sample t-test answers the question, do the two results agree with each other within experimental error? Okay, so is there a significant difference between the two methods? Okay, so we have these two figures here. These two figures show method A in the in the blue Gaussian curve and method B with a red Gaussian curve. So this one is the mean of method A and this one is the mean of method B. So the question is, are these two methods significantly different from each other? So in order to answer that question, we should make use of the two sample t-test in case 2. Another figure provided here is, is method A significantly different from method B given this uh, difference in their, you know, in their, given this difference in their results. Okay, so we have to make use of two sample t-test in this case. Okay, so in order to do a two sample t-test, we have to follow the given steps first establish that there is no significant difference between the precision of two methods using the f test if the value of f is one or similar to one one or near one meaning there is no significant difference between the precision of two methods take note that s1 is the standard deviation for method one and s2 is the standard deviation for method two the square of the standard deviation is what we call the variance. So this one is um, dividing the two variances of the two methods. The second step is to calculate for the pooled standard deviation. The formula for the pooled standard deviation, uh, pooled standard deviation is designated as SP. And the formula for the pooled standard deviation is square root of n sub 1 minus 1 multiplied by the variance of method 1 plus n sub 2 minus 1 multiplied by variance of 
method 2 all over n sub 1 plus n sub 2 minus 2. n sub 1 is the number of measurements of method 1, n sub 2 is the number of measurements of um, method 2. This expression at the bottom, n1 plus n2 minus 2, is what we call the degrees of freedom, or the df. And finally, we have to calculate the test statistic, the value of the test statistic. The value of the test statistic is um, designated by this formula. We have mean of method 1 minus mean of method 2 all over the whole standard deviation multiplied by square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. Uh, in order to understand this concept, we have to make use of some examples. So this, these two sample t-tests answers the question, do the two methods agree with each other within experimental error? If they do not agree, most likely one of those methods have, um, a lot of those methods have systematic error in them. Okay, suppose we have a spectroscopic analysis okay, by two students. Two students perform a spectroscopic analysis of lead. Okay, they have the same sample, but student A got the following result and student B got another result. Okay, student A performed, uh, we have, let's say, 10 replicates and student B also performed, uh, student B performed 12 replicates. Okay, the, the mean of the measurement of student A is 3.20 ppm and the mean of the measurement of student B is 3.30 ppm. The standard deviations are the following. So the question is, are the two results statistically different? Or is there a significant difference between the two results? Okay, so in order to answer that question, we have to make use of the two sample t-tests. First, we have to calculate the value of f by dividing the two variances. So we have 0 0.15 squared over 0 0.18 squared. Okay, the value is 0 0.694. Next is we would like to determine the value of the pooled standard deviation. The formula for the pooled standard deviation is sp is equal to square root of n1 minus 1 s1 squared plus n2 minus 1 s2 squared all over n1 plus n2 minus 2. n1 is 10 minus 1 s1 squared is 0 0.15 squared plus 12 minus 1 0 0.18 squared all over 10 plus 12 minus 2. Okay, the value of the pooled standard deviation is therefore 0 0.167. Finally, we would like to calculate the value of the test statistic. This one is number one, number two, and number three. The value of the test statistic is designated by this formula over SP, one over N1 plus one over N2. Okay, the mean is 3.20 minus 3.30 all over 0 0.167 this one is plus minus square root of 1 over 10 plus 1 over 12 okay, the value of the test statistic is 1.397 okay, 1.397 okay take note that if the value of the test statistic experimental value is greater than the value from the table, therefore there is a significant difference. Okay, the value of the t from the table is okay, the value of t from the table is determined from the value of the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is 20 and the confidence interval. Confidence interval is 95%. So just look at the degrees of freedom of 20 and 95% confidence interval. So in this case, degrees of freedom of 20 
and confidence interval of 95. So we have 2.086. T-table is 2.086 and our T-value is 1.397. Since experimental T-value is less than T-table, therefore there is no significant difference in the two measurements in the two methodologies the two measurements made by student a and student b okay so that is how you make use of statistical methods to determine whether or not there is random error or systematic error in your measurement finally i would like to relate all these concepts to random error and systematic error so first Measurements that have low precision or a percent RSD that is very large, these are the measurements that may contain random error in order to detect whether or not there is outlier in our measurement. So in order to reject or to remove this outlier which may have arisen from random error, then we have to address it using Q-test. On the other hand, if if the measurement has low accuracy or a high percent error, most likely there is systematic error in that measurement. So in order to detect whether or not there is systematic error, we have to make use of student's t-test. We, we can use case 1 or 1 sample t-test or case 2, the 2 sample t-test. Okay, so that is the end of our lesson this evening.